Hey guys, uh, today we're going to talk about settling the West. Okay, so we're going to get into some things uh, that happen after Reconstruction and kind of uh, the U.S. expansion westward. Okay, so here we go. So in 1859, uh, a guy by the name of Henry Comstock, that's this handsome fellow right here, he discovered silver in Nevada. And so Virginia City, which is in Nevada, became a boom town. It was built up really quickly. Um, but when the silver ran out, it became what is known as a ghost town. So basically what happened was he discovered silver. Everybody rushes there to get as much silver as they can. Silver's gone. Time to go to the next thing. So this is going to be the cycle that is going to repeat throughout the West. Okay, so somebody's going to discover something that's valuable, whether it be silver, whether it be gold. People are going to rush there. People are going to leave there. Okay, but this is going to help to grow Colorado, Montana, and both the Dakotas, so North and South Dakota. And we're going to start to see railroads being built uh, in order to su send supplies and that to the West. Okay, so it's a little easier to, to transport goods, people, things of that nature. Um, but Denver uh, is going to become a major supply station, and so this is why Denver today is such a large city. Um, so after the Civil War, many Americans began building large cattle ranches on the Great Plains. Uh, the cattle ranching industry is going to grow in part because of what is known as the open range. So the open range is just big, vast areas of grasslands that's owned by the federal government. So it's just, just nothing. You know, it's just grass and very flat, and it's very ideal for uh, cattle ranching, okay? Now, the major route for moving cattle is going to be known as the Chisholm Trail. And so the Chisholm Trail goes from Texas um, all the way up to Abilene, Kansas. And so what they would do is they would drive the cattle up and then they would sell it, okay? So a long drive began with, with the spring roundup to collect the cattle from the open range and then those cattle will be divided and branded, and then those cowboys will move their herds um, along the trails up to the rail lines where they will sell that cattle, and they'll make a profit off of that. Okay? Um, so the Great Plains, uh, the Great Plains extends westward to the Rocky Mountains from Kansas. So basically right here, it's this area right here in red. Okay, so it's just basically Kansas and West, all the way until you hit the Rockies, okay? Now, it's very dry in the Great Plains. It's not quite a desert, but it's still very, very dry. So rainfall is less than 20 inches a year. Um, the herds of buffalo used to graze on the prairie grasses there, but the problem is, is the Great Plains is really unfit for farming because it doesn't rain a lot. And so people began to settle the Great Plains because of the railroad. Um, now, the thing is, is like I just said, not ideal for farming. So it's not going to be a major uh, place where people really are going to be crazy attracted to it. Um, but some people who are wanting to escape city life or uh, just want a fresh start, those are the kinds of folks who are going to be going to this area. So uh, the federal government is going to pass what's known as the Homestead Act. And so the federal government is going to help settle people in this land. So uh, for less than $10, they could buy 160 acres worth of land. But the catch is that they have to live there for five years. Now, like I said, the environment is very harsh in the Great Plains. So weather is bad. There's a lot of tornadoes. There's a lot of uh, fires and swarms of grasshoppers. Uh, dust storms. There's all kinds of different things that go on in the Great Plains. So it was not necessarily ideal uh, to live there, but for less than $10, you get 160 acres. Um, that's not too bad of a deal. Um, so new inventions are going to help these farmers that move into the Great Plains. So um, they're going to start to uh, they're going to start to engage in what is called dry farming. So on the Great Plains, what happens is is the farmers plant seeds, but they plant them really deep in the ground because there's more moisture down down below, okay? Um, so they're going to also have new steel plows that are going to be able to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, seed drills, reapers, and then threshing machines are going to help make it 
all possible and they're going to help to make it more um, sustainable and more, uh, I guess, more convenient, easier to do. Um, their primary crop is going to be wheat and because wheat is a very hardy plant, okay? It can grow in very harsh conditions. And so wheat is going to become the most important crop of the Great Plains. Uh, so many farmers are going to move to the Great Plains in order to harvest their wheat. And so it's going to be known as the wheat belt. Okay, we live in what's called the corn belt, just so you know. Uh, but they're going to create what are called bonanza farms. And basically, these are large single-family farms, up to 50,000 acres. So that's a lot of acres. Um, in the 1890s, a glut of wheat will cause prices to drop, however, because so many different farmers were, uh, were harvesting wheat. And so there's too much of it in circulation, and so that causes the prices to drop. And so some of these farmers are going to lose their land because they couldn't pay back their bank loans. And then, um, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a prolonged drought. And then that's going to make matters worse. And so because all of a sudden there's going to be no wheat to sell. And then they're going to force a lot of those farmers to move back east. Okay, so this right here um, shows you the different belts, I guess. The agricultural regions of the United States okay so the Great Plains we're talking is in this area right here okay so you have wheat belt you, this winter wheat belt the spring wheat belt right in this area here as you can see we live we live like right on the edge of the corn belt and general farming we have pretty good farmland in this area here okay all right so Native Americans so uh, most Native Americans of the Great Plains were nomads. So what they would do is they would move from place to place in search of food. And so they would often follow the herds of the buffalo because they often hunted buffalo. Now these people lived in extended family networks and they had a very close relationship with nature. So their religion was derived by nature. And so these, these peoples divided into bands and they practice a religion, like I said, based on spiritual powerful power of nature. And you could see the, these, the different people we're talking about. So the Pawnees, the Comanches, Cheyenne, Arapaho, the Crows, the Sioux. Okay, we're talking in this area here, okay, in the green. Um, so the Native Americans had been under pressure from advancing white settlement. So basically what's going on is the... Uh, European Americans are moving farther and farther west, and the farther west they move, the less room there is for the Native Americans that are there. So in 1862, this is during the Civil War, the Sioux in Minnesota launched an uprising. Um, now, they had agreed to live on a reservation in Minnesota in exchange for annuities paid by the federal government. So basically, they said, okay, we'll we'll take this section of land and we'll stay here. And then the, basically the government paid them to do that. Okay. The problem is, is the annuities were small and then they were often taken by American traders. So what happened was, is American traders would come there and then they would, uh, they would trade goods that for way more than they should be. Okay, uh, and then they that those annuities would be paid basically to those traders. So they basically took those. Um, and then what's going to happen is Congress is going to delay payments, and then the Sioux uh, were starving as well. So this is going to lead to an uprising. So in December of 1866, uh, Chief Red Cloud's forces defeated an army detachment um, in Montana. And I highlight this, I forgot to make that one yellow. Uh, but that's going to be known as Fetterman's Massacre. I think it is bolded in your notes, okay? But make sure you highlight that, Fetterman's Massacre, okay? Um, so in the 1860s, tension between the Cheyenne and the Arapaho and miners in Colorado are going to increase, and so the Native Americans attacked wagon trains and ranches in Colorado. Um, now, Colorado's not a state yet, but so the territor territorial governors are going to order the Native Americans to surrender at Fort Lyon. Um, and what happens here is that Chief Black Kettle is going to bring 
hundreds of people to negotiate. Um, and as they come to negotiate, the U.S. Army is going to attack them, not expecting so many people. I don't know, like all the specific details, who shot first or whatever, but the U.S. Army annihilates Chief Black Kettle's uh, people, and it, uh, this is known as the Sand Creek Massacre. Um, in 1867, uh, the Indian Peace Commission is going to propose two large reservations that are going to basically just be there for the... Um, for the Native Americans, and then they would go there, and then the federal government would leave them alone, okay? So within the government, the Bureau of Indian Affairs would run these reservations, um, and the U.S. Army would deal with anyone who didn't report to the reservation, okay? And then they would sign treaties. Basically, signing treaties didn't necessarily ensure that anyone would abide by the terms. They were, you know, treaties are only as good as your word, anything is. Uh, and so even though you sign this piece of paper, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to engage in the behavior that you're saying you're going to. Uh, so in the 1870s, Buffalo were starting to disappear. Uh, many of them were killed by migrants. So all those people who were flooding into the Great Plains, uh, they're killed by professional buffalo hunters um, or sharpshooters. So the railroads would have sharpshooters and they would kill buffalo so that they would uh, stay away from the train tracks and then just hunters in general. So there's a lot of different uh, reasons there why the buffalo are being killed off. Many Native Americans are going to leave the reservations in order to hunt the buffalo, so that's going to violate the treaty. And then in 1876, the Lakota left their reservation in Montana, which is near Bighorn Mountains. And so... In 1876, the U.S. is going to send General A. Custer, um, who is the commander of the 7th Cavalry. He is going to go up to, um, to the Lakota. He is going to divide his forces and attack Lakota and the Cheyenne at Little Bighorn River. So the Native Americans killed all the soldiers. This was a major massacre of the, of the U.S. troops. And Sitting Bull and his followers, so Sitting Bull was the uh, chief of the Lakota, and his followers are going to flee to Canada. Um, the Nez Perce and Chief Joseph uh, refused to move to a reservation in Idaho in 1877, and so they fled, but they were forced to move to Oklahoma. In 1890, the Lakota were ordered to stop what's known as the Ghost Dance. So the Ghost Dance is basically a ritual that celebrated the hope that whites would disappear, that the buffalo would return, and then Native Americans would reunite with ancestors. So they were ordered to stop celebrating the fact that, that they were hoping that all the white people in, in North America would disappear. Um, so the dancers are going to flee. They're going to be chased by U.S. troops to Wounded Knee Creek. And uh, many Lakota were killed at Wounded Knee. And this was the last big Native American resistance to federal authority. Um, so some Native Amer or some Americans opposed the treatment of, Na of the Native Americans. Um, so they thought that relations would improve if the Native Americans simply assimilated with U.S. culture. So basically that just where they get absorbed into the society, they, they adopt our language, they, they adopt not necessarily a religion, but they just become a part of the U.S. culture. And they, many people thought they could do that um, by becoming landowners and citizens. So what's going to happen is the Dawes Act is going to break up reservations into allotments to be farmed by families. But very few people wanted to do this, and then the allotments were too small anyway for many families. Uh, but basically, the way Native Americans lived was in extended families, and so when you try to make them go down into single nuclear families, it becomes uh, much more difficult for them. But very few Native Americans at the time were willing to adopt the American culture in place of their own, and so uh, assimilation was not really going to happen at that point. All right, so that's it. So I hope you guys all have a good day and don't forget to do your processor.